Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we're going to have another lesson from CEDH. CEDH is a metagame within the Commander format that sits in one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. Not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames, but there are lessons to be learned from how people are brewing with the most powerful cards. And this week, I would like to talk about an article that came out recently on Commander's Herald from one Corbin Hostler of Brainstorm Brewery fame. Recently, Corbin posted that article and argued that tutors as a concept are bad for Commander, based on a tweet from Marshall Sutcliffe of Limited Resources fame. Full disclosure, I am a big fan of both of these guys and the work that they put out every week on their podcasts. Corbin, Marshall, if you're listening, keep up the awesome work, and Corbin, buy some WD-40 or something for your chair. The arguments that Corbin made in his article were well thought out, and they broke down to this. Number one, searching and shuffling is time-consuming, and not the fun part of why we play Magic or Commander. Number two, tutoring decreases variety of gameplay. When you can consistently get to specific cards, it reduces the amount of variety between each individual game you play. Finally, Corbin argued that tutoring reduces the fun, the thrill of the top deck, so to speak, when you draw that perfect card that you needed to get you out of that situation. A few days later, Rebel Sun posted a great video with her thoughts on the subject as well, and she added a further point about the concept of decision paralysis, the hemming and the hawing over whether to get X or Y or Z, which makes the game less fun for the person tutoring and for the opponents waiting for that tutor to resolve. Rebel's video also went into some great arguments for why tutors are very good and very helpful for the format too. Essentially, Rebel argued that tutors are a good balancing factor against the person who had the nut draw or the god hand. A hand that includes mana crypt in the opener tends to be a lot more powerful than a hand which does not have a mana crypt. But having access to a tutor to then go fetch your own mana crypt to catch up to the person who went ahead with their turn one mana crypt, that provides a lot more balance between the inherent variability of the opening hands in games of Commander. Rebel went on to argue that removing tutors wouldn't actually reduce variety of gameplay, as decks already build for consistency with large numbers of redundant effects, in which Rebel cites the old cube theory or the 8x8 theory of deck building, where essentially you want packages of similar cards that fill a similar role in your deck in order to have that foundation, that base of redundant effects to achieve your deck's desired outcome. Finally, Rebel put forth the notion that tutors create interesting decision points for a player to make. The example she used was, essentially, do I go for the safe incremental play, get a banner rock or another card draw engine, or do I get greedy and try to go for the win? I've included links to both Corbin's initial article and Rebel's response video in the description. I would be really interested to hear what you think of these arguments, and now I'm going to pose a few of my own. And the question that I want to answer is, when is a tutor right for my deck, and when is it right for my pod? My argument is that it's less about the tutor and more about what you're tutoring for. Even at the most basic use case, a player casting Cultivate out of a Commander 2020 precon like Symbiotic Swarm is tutoring for that swamp and that planes that he or she needs to be able to cast that Abzan Commander for the deck. And I don't think a lot of us would begrudge that player. Some fundamental level of consistency is necessary just to be able to play the game at its most basic level. I would even go further with what Rebel had described in her video and argue that at tables where decks are on a level playing field, this is going to force players into interesting decisions on what they're going to use that tutor for. When you are steamrolling the other decks at the table, the decision is simple. You just get a way to win. But when you're playing a closer game, the decision of getting greedy and going for it has consequences, which you learn to weigh against playing for an incremental gain, like spending that tutor to get a mana rock or a source of card draw. As I alluded to at the beginning of my arguments, there are also different types of tutors, ranging from the base level of green land ramp, trying to just get more lands onto the battlefield to enable your basic strategy, to conditional tutors such as open the armory, which tends to be less powerful than tutoring for anything with a card like Demonic Tutor, even if it's at the same cost. The lesson here from CEDH is that many players consider black to be the most powerful color in CEDH purely because black has access to the most unconditional tutors in the game, and these tend to be the most powerful. 
That said, if you're running a deck that has unconditional tutors, the power that you can use those to get is limited to, well, the most powerful cards you have in your deck. If you're using them simply to enable a hidden commander type strategy, or you have an achievement unlock deck, hat tip to Andy and Sean over at the Commander's Brew, where you have a card in your deck that you're kind of using as a commander that you couldn't otherwise, you need ways to be able to find that card to simply enable your deck to work at its most basic level. A good estimate of how powerful the cards are that you're tutoring for is how efficient the cards you're tutoring for. In her video, Repl mentioned specifically that that early demonic tutor can often be used to find a mana crypt. This line translates with her being up to mana when she untaps on her next turn. This effect costs a total of three and a green to go up to mana in the color of green, which is supposed to be the best color at persistent ramp with effects like Ranger's Path or Sky Shroud Claim. As a point of comparison, let's replace Mana Crypt in the above example with a Soul Ring. It now costs two and a black to go up two mana on her next turn. And that jump from three mana to five mana represents a 67% increase instead of a 100% increase. This line is demonstrably less efficient. And let's iterate on this again with the same point. Let's replace Demonic Tutor with the recently reprinted Grim Tutor. Now the line costs two black black to go up two mana on her next turn, jumping from four mana to six mana. And this increases the mana you're going to untap with by 50%. Again, demonstrably less efficient. This means it takes more time in order to execute on these effects, and this means that the effects, while they are all increasing the amount of mana you would untap with by two, the impact of each of those effects is smaller relative to the initial board state. I'm going to try to tie these different lines of argument together, and you may have noticed in the past that I've described my decks as being linear, or being chaotic, or even being casual in some of the other episodes that we've released. I try to describe linear decks as being as consistent as they can possibly be, but accepting the trade-off that they are aiming to be consistent at a not particularly efficient strategy. For example, our first episode was about Galta, and Galta is a deck that attempts to storm off in mono green while I dig for Aetherflux Reservoir to win. Chaotic decks, on the other hand, sacrifice that highly consistent game plan, but since these decks don't run as many tutors, I can make up for it by running more efficient cards with a lower mana cost, so I can still have some reliable way to build up to the critical mass of synergy I need to get those emergent combos going. I recently talked about Torbrand, Thane of Redfell, and that deck specifically runs zero tutors, but I tried to maintain a lean mana curve and run lots of redundant effects that capitalize on Torbrand's plus two damage. When you combine consistency of tutors with highly efficient lines to tutor for, that you start warping the game past what non-optimized decks can be expected to keep up with. I tend to define optimized decks as ones that have high degrees of consistency and efficiency, accepting no trade-offs in either particular direction. I would argue that a linear deck and a chaotic deck can sit at the same table together and be at similar power level, with one having a more consistent game plan, but the other having a more efficient game plan overall. It's when you can tutor for Thassa's Oracle and Demonic Consultation, that's a highly efficient way to end the game. Tutoring for Knowledge Pool with Lavinia out can elicit lots of groans and bring the game to a halt. But at most tables, tutoring for your deck's primary engine or a game plan is usually going to be met with a fair degree of acceptance, even if your opponents may decide to answer the card that you tutored for. They're going to be more upset in general if you're tutoring for a way to end the game in a similar way every time. And I think that this is at the heart of the disagreement that players often have about the role of tutors in our format. If you look back at the examples that Corbin gave in his initial article, both his entries for Tutors Make the Game Repetitive and Tutors Make the Game More Unfun specifically cite the ways that you're going to be ending the game the same way every time. Specifically mentioning, for example, it's unfun when the Lord Windgrace deck is going to ramp for five or six cards, draw some cards along the way, and then cast Torment of Hailfire and the tutors only make it more consistent to reach that Torment of Hailfire. I have some more in-depth thoughts about the tempo of a game of Commander overall, but I think that's going to be best saved for another episode. I think that about wraps up what tutors mean for your deck, and for your pod, and for your playgroup. 
It's less about the tutor itself and more about what you're tutoring for. When decks are at a level playing field with other decks at the table, then tutors can be as unconditional as you want and will often still result in good, interesting gameplay. If you're not certain, or if there's something specific you are trying to get out of your deck, trying to reach for tutors that are either less efficient, tutor targets that are less efficient, or tutors that are more conditional are ways to limit the reach of your tutors and lower your threat level overall at the table. Try to decide if you want your deck to be one that is more linear, where you're going to lean on tutors to pull off a very specific but arguably pretty spicy game plan, or you're looking for a more chaotic deck which leans away from tutors but then allows you to take advantage of more efficient effects. If you are looking for both high efficiency and high consistency, you are probably looking at an optimized deck which may not be right for every table. So what are your thoughts on tutors? You can add us on Twitter. We are at GemstoneMindMTG. Or you can send us an email where we are GemstoneMindPodcast at gmail.com. Or leave a comment here on YouTube where you can find us under GemstoneMind. We'll be back again next week for another episode. But until then, I'm John. This is Gemstone Mind. Take care. You can reach the crew from Gemstone Mind on Twitter at GemstoneMindMTG. Or send us an email at GemstoneMindPodcast at gmail.com. On YouTube, we're Gemstone Mind Podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.